will, open your Bibles in the New Testament to John chapter 14. We're going to pick up our study in John chapter 14 and verse 15 today. We're going to begin by reading a portion of this chapter that will exceed our ability to expound today. In fact, this section will take us two or three weeks to kind of work through. And I want to read the entire paragraph because I want you to see the particular verses that we're focusing upon today in their immediate context so that we would not do a disservice to this text and to the imperatives that are embedded in the broader indicatives as Jesus speaks about the proper demonstration of love for him in obedience to his word. We must see that in the larger context of God's preceding love for us and his continual presence with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to begin our study by reading verses 15 through 24 today. Before we read those verses, let's bow together. Our God and Father, we thank you that you have given your word unto us as your people And even more, O Lord, that you have sent your Spirit into our hearts to help us to see and to understand, to rightly divide your Word. We know, O God, that we are fallible hearers and interpreters, fallible spokesmen and preachers. And we pray, O God, that your Spirit would be He who guides us and helps us this day, giving us eyes to see your truth, helping us in our hearts, O Lord, to be enlarged by your love, to see and appreciate, O God, the way in which we are called to respond to that love through our own loving obedience to your word. Encourage us, O Lord, sanctify us, strengthen and help us, and be honored among us, we pray in this study. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Hear now God's word, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. Our Lord Jesus is speaking in these verses. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to Jesus, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you have heard or that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Thus far the reading of God's word May he add his blessing to it. The word love has been so subjectivized as to be almost without any uh, discernible objective meaning in our society today. English was already prone to this in a number of ways. We used love in an exceedingly broad and seemingly inconsistent fashion. Uh, People say they love their children and they also love ice cream. Uh, Christians will say we love our Lord and we love baseball. But surely we would recognize that these loves really do not belong in the same categories. Lately, however, it seems as though American culture has lost all contact with objective meaning in terms of love. Love is now the justification, in fact, in our society for all kinds of perversion and wickedness. It used to be that a husband left his wife because he was admittedly sinful and adulterous, and so said society. Now he does so because he is in love, or at least that's what they say. Parents used to discipline their children because they loved them and wanted to spare them the self-destructive consequences of a disobedient life. Now, parents refuse to discipline their children and encourage them in their self-destruction because they love them, or so we say. We're witnessing the multifaceted grandeur of an incoherent irrationalism. And it should be no surprise in such a culture and moment that even the religious community struggles to maintain a firm grasp on what love really is and means. And this is especially the case when you have religious leaders and popular pastors and writers writing books that advocate a version of God's love that flattens out any redemptive purpose. 
that essentially has God saving people from what we do not know because there is nothing really to fear because in the end, love wins. We must learn what it is to love biblically and truly and we must not surrender that term to its cultural redefinition that is underway today. Now in these verses today, as I said, we're going to be spending some time over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I don't want to, to try to expound the entire paragraph that we just read, but I do want you to see the verses that particularly have our attention this morning in their immediate context. And we'll be looking in particular at verse 15, verse 21, and verses 23 and 24. The relationship of love for Christ and its proper manifestation in obedience cannot be separated from the preceding love of God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the ongoing communion that we enjoy with God through Him. And that's the context in which Jesus makes this statement that is probably familiar to all of us in verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now immediately, some of you may notice a difference between the way that that verse is translated in the English Standard Version I'm reading out of this morning and the way that your own Bible may read. Some of you have that verse 15 uh, stated in the form of an imperative. It is a command. If you love me, keep my commandments. So the difference here is the spelling of the relevant verb in the second clause of the verse. In some Greek manuscripts it's spelled one way and in other Greek manuscripts it's spelled another way. It's a difference of one letter and yet that one letter makes the difference between an indicative, a promise, and an imperative or a command. Now theologically both of these readings are acceptable since scripture indicates that both statements are true. If you love Christ, what would Christ have you do? keep his commandments. He would command you to do that as you're empowered by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that works effectually in your life. There's a command there. There's the imperative flowing out of the indicative, right? But also there is a promise that if you love Christ, you will in fact keep his commandments because you are kept by the power of God through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Or as Paul would say in Philippians chapter 2, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work within you both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. Now, the majority of modern commentators and translators prefer the future tense that's found here in the ESV. I'm a little more persuaded by the textual evidence that the context favors the imperative form, but the point remains the same in either case, and it wouldn't do, uh, be a good use of our time to get bogged down in the textual minutia of that uh, spelling. Love for Christ is properly demonstrated by obedience to his commands. That's the point either way you take the verse. Whether it is an imperative or an indicative, whether it is a command or a promise, love for Christ is properly demonstrated by obedience to his commands. Now what does it mean to say then, I love Christ? Many people, it seems like at least, think that they can answer that in whatever way they want, in whatever way seems best to them. They'll say, I love Christ even though they disregard the church, they live in defiance of God's law, and they have no discernible relationship with Him. And in that case, you have to ask, well, what does that really mean? You say you love Jesus, but what does that mean when your life seems to stand in defiance of that claim? It's like an abusive husband or boyfriend who, as he's being put in the back of a police car, says, honey, you know that I love you. Well, what does that mean? If love lets you beat your spouse, we need a different word to describe the husband's responsibility to his bride. Love does not allow for that kind of behavior, and in those situations, we're able to see it. See, this is the irrationality and incoherence of our current cultural context. We get some of these values if we simply change the circumstances or the context of the conversation. And yet when we put love into the context of religion, it's as if we've lost any sense at all of what the term means or should look like. If my son is destroying his life with drugs, it's not love that allows him to continue buying and abusing himself and those drugs. It's love that says no more. Love acts in accord with the good of the person who is loved. And because that is the case, Love must be joined with another word that it is rarely seen in conjunction with in our current culture, and that is the word duty. What does love have to do with duty? Well, love provides the context and motivation for which duty provides the content and direction. Love gives us the context and motivation. 
Duty gives us the content and direction. Now, this means that love and duty are not synonyms. And this is an example of sloppy exegesis sometimes when pastors treat this text. If you love me, keep my commandments, and they begin to act as if these two terms, love and obedience, are interchangeable values as if they stand in clear parallel with one another in such a way that one can substitute for the other. I love Christ, I obey Christ, to obey Christ is to love Christ, to love Christ is to obey Christ, kind of, sort of, not exactly. They're not interchangeable terms. You can't say, I love Christ because I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I go to church on Sundays. The Pharisees do all of that and far more and they do not love God or Christ. That's not loving God at all. Duty is not love. And love is not merely duty. But love has no substance apart from duty. Love without duty, without that content and direction, is directionless. It's subjective and subject to selfish, idolatrous redefinition. Love needs duty to give it context and substance. God does not desire a perfunctory duty that is devoid of our hearts. He doesn't desire either an undirected love which disregards his word and our moral duty. Love and duty go together in the Christian life. One responds to the one who first loved us and whose love has changed us, and the other gives direction and context for that response of love to God. A loveless performance of external ritual is not true obedience. It is not what our Lord commands or observes. D.A. Carson, in his commentary on this passage, says, quote, Mere duty will not generate obedience to Christ. Only love for him can do that, end quote. Well, that's helpful. It's important to remember that. You may be doing exactly the same things, and yet one person is doing it strictly out of a sense of duty and defining that dutiful performance as if it were love for Christ. Another person is performing the very same duty, but he's doing so out of love for Christ. One person is loving Jesus, the other person is not. One person's actions are pleasing to God, the other person's actions are not. You must not treat this concept in a reductionistic fashion. How do we love God? Well, we love God by keeping his commandments. How do we demonstrate love for Christ? We demonstrate love for Christ by obeying his word. Obedience is a fruit of love. It is an evidence of love, a fruit and evidence, our confession would say, of saving faith. And once again, I think we see this, we understand this at least in principle in other social contexts. Kirstie's birthday is coming up in August, and I have decided already that I will not be buying her the four-volume set of Richard Muller's Post-Reformation Reform Dogmatics. That would be a lovely gift, by the way, but not for her. She would not appreciate that. Love is best expressed by giving to another person what most honors, pleases, and blesses them. I cannot redefine love in a way that suits my own selfishness because love is by nature unselfish and its actions demonstrate that. Do you understand now how how duty is connecting here? It's not that duty is love. It's that you can't properly love without a sense of duty, without a sense of responsibility, without some idea, some direction of how to pursue what most pleases, honors, and blesses the person who is loved. Now, in this case, there's nothing that we can do to benefit God, but we can certainly honor him. We can certainly please him, and we do that by listening to him and responding to him according to his word. True love is expressed in action, not merely experienced as an emotion or offered as a verbal statement. It's nice to be told that someone loves you. It is better to know that they do. And the only way that you know that they do is by their actions. And this is how God has revealed his love for his children. It's not merely by saying loving things, but it is by giving his son on the cross to save sinners. This is how we know the love of God. As John says in his first epistle in 1 John 4, he says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 
He says, this is how you know what love is. You look at the cross. That's what shows to you the true meaning of love. That's what shows to you the love of God. It's no good merely to say, I love Christ, or to feel love for him. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And if you truly love him, you will keep his commandments. Not perfectly, none of us do, but you will keep his commandments sincerely and seriously. We cannot redefine love apart from obedience because we love Christ by obeying him. Now, this obedient love for Christ does not appear or continue to exist in our lives in a vacuum. And this is why we need the context of the paragraph that we're going to expound, Lord willing, next week or over the next couple of weeks. We need that context to understand the the way in which this love appears in our life and the way that this love is sustained in our life. Our love for Christ is prompted by the preceding love of God that we receive through union with Christ. And it continues to flourish in our lives by the sustaining grace of God that is mediated to us by the Spirit's indwelling. Now once again, we see this elaborated in 1 John. John, I'm persuaded, is elaborating on central theological themes from the Gospel of John in his first epistle. He says in 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Earlier in that same chapter of the letter, he said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And what he's saying is love is the evidence. Love, our love, is the fruit of God's prior love for us. How how do I know that I love God? I, I, I know because his love has first come into my life and changed me. It's changed my heart. It's changed my attitude. It is changing my life imperfectly, incompletely, but nevertheless in a real way, in a substantive fashion. This love to which we are called is of God. And we see that in Jesus' discussion of it in our text today. Jesus was not abandoning his disciples. He says, I will come to you, verse 18. Now, we'll discuss this a little bit either next week or the week following. But but some commentators would take this as a a reference to Christ's reappearance among the disciples after his resurrection. Some might even take it as a reference to his second coming. I, I believe this is a reference to the fact that his presence would continue to be mediated among the disciples by the Spirit who was coming to abide with them. In other words, the world will not see Christ at this time, but the church sees Christ. The world does not know Christ, but the church knows Christ. The the, the world does not have Christ, but the church has Christ because the Spirit is coming from heaven and He is the Spirit of the living Christ. He is the Spirit of the Lord. The point is that the disciples would not be left on their own to figure out how to obey Christ in their own strength. It's not as though the Lord simply revealed His will and then left them to fend for themselves. His love initiated a relationship and then empowered their response of love as part of that relationship. And His presence with them would support and sustain their participation in the divine life of loving relationship that is then demonstrated by obedience. Brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you this morning is that we cannot live the Christian life on our own. We must not reduce it merely to participation in religious ritual and spiritual disciplines. We need the sustaining grace of God in all of our work and service. We need the presence of Christ in our lives to share in the true life to which we have been called. And so if you are looking to yourself and to your own life for strength to to obey verse 15, you are looking to the wrong source. This is why we need the context of this passage is so that you don't read John 14, 15 and walk away and say, okay, pull myself up by the bootstraps, right? Uh, I'm going to prepare myself for action. God has done his part. Now it's my turn. It's not the way that works. It's not what Jesus is discussing. Rather, you are to look to Jesus. You are to rely upon his spirit who dwells in you. And this does not mean to be passive in your obedience, not at all, but it does mean to resist the temptation to rely upon your strength as if the key to loving Christ were yourself. You are not strong enough to do so. He is strong enough, and he's the only one who can enable you to do so. Now, in verses 21 to 24, there are some very important ideas that I want to begin to develop here uh, that, that I need you to listen very carefully I think everything up to this point in the, in the text and in our exposition of it is, is probably familiar. It's probably just a reminder. But, but there's some material here that, that I think is, is very important for us to grapple with, that we will wrestle in ourselves 
with these ideas. In verse 21, Jesus says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will come. I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 23, he continues this idea. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Do you want to live with God? And more specifically, do you want God to come into your heart, into your life, into your home, and live with you? Because that is what Jesus promises here to everyone whose love for him is demonstrated by obedience. Now, it's not promised to those who say they love Jesus but disregard his word. This blessing is not for those who want the saving benefits of Christ while seeking to remain Lord and master of their own lives. This gift is for those who love Christ and who yield to him, who acknowledge that I cannot live on my own terms anymore. I do not have the wisdom, strength, or competence to guide my own life. I need the Lord to guide me. I need him not only to forgive me and save me, but to direct and protect me and to enable me to do what is truly good. It's to that person that Jesus says the Father and I will come to him and make our home with him. And what I want you to recognize is that Jesus is describing an intimacy in our communion that goes beyond just the possession or experience of salvation. And that if you're simply content to say, I want justification from Jesus and I'm good. I want to be justified, my sins forgiven, Christ's righteousness imputed to me, and that's enough, right? That much and no more. That's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. There's more here to be seen. There's more here to be enjoyed. Jesus is talking about the triune God in the, through the agency of the Holy Spirit coming and taking up residence with you. I'm going to live with you. Not just, not just you all will be my people, but you are going to experience the presence of the living God. The Christian life is not merely a philosophical system of ideas. It's not merely an ethical system. It's not merely a religious tradition. The Christian life is the experience of relationship with the eternal triune God. Now, Christianity includes religious practice. It includes ethical living. There are philosophical ideas that need to be reflected upon and affirmed, but it cannot be reduced to any of these things. A man could be religious and ethical and philosophical and not be in any meaningful sense a follower of Christ. The Christian life is to live in fellowship with God. It is to have the Father and the Son come to you in the person of the Spirit to dwell with you, to save and sanctify and support you. It is to live quorum Deo, before the face of God, as you sojourn in this world as a pilgrim. It is to know a higher relationship than any that you will ever share with other people, a higher love than you will ever experience anywhere else, a higher purpose than you would otherwise have living merely in terms of of your earthly existence. And that is the the realization that Asaph comes to in Psalm 73 that we just sang. Whom have I in heaven but you? There is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. It's that realization. This is the Christian life. This is the spiritual life. It's not about having success in the present age. It's not about being healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's not just about having my life externally ordered in a certain way. It's about experiencing life with God, relationship with God, fellowship with God. He has come and taken up his abode with me. Now, are you experiencing the joy of God's presence in your life? Now, we will not always know that joy in a tangible and emotional way. And I don't want you to walk away this morning thinking that what I'm suggesting is that, well, if if I'm not always experiencing this internal happiness, well, then I must not be a faithful Christian. That's that's not my point. That's not not the point of this sermon. It's not the point of Jesus in this passage. But don't you want to experience that joy? That joy that transcends pain? That joy that transcends our tears, our griefs, our questions, our doubts, our unbelief? Sometimes God may feel very far away from us. We may wonder if he is aware of us at all. And that may be for many reasons. It may be external trials and pressures that rob us of our awareness of this joy. It may be internal conflicts and trials that trouble our hearts. But as we've said many times before, there are three things that we can be sure of. 
Three things that never change no matter what we experience in this life. Who God is, what Christ has done, and what He has promised to those who love Him. These are unchanging truths because God Himself is unchangeable. They anchor your joy in eternal realities when, which temporal and earthly trials can never take away. And so when these trials come upon you, when you are overtaken by pain and grief, there is no promise that we'll just, just wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow will be better. No, tomorrow may be worse. I'm in pain. I'm sick. There's no, there's no prospect of recovery. Well, just, you know, just pray about it and you'll feel better. You may not. You may not. You may feel worse and then you'll die. God doesn't make these kind of promises to you. He doesn't say, if you just serve me, everything is going to go well in your life. But who God is, what Christ has done, and what he has promised is not changeable. It's eternal. And that's how we rejoice. Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You don't rejoice in your pain. You don't rejoice in your problems. But you rejoice in the Lord in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your suffering. We rejoice even as we suffer because we know what Christ has done. And we know the implications of having the Father and the Son dwelling with us in the person of the Spirit. It, it gives us a joy that transcends all of our grief and pain. Now this is where I need to be very, very careful as I make the next point. And I want to ask you to listen carefully and charitably so that you do not misunderstand the point that's being made. There is some suffering and joylessness that is outside of our control in our life. I would never, never suggest that if you simply order your life in the right way, then you'll never suffer. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. You'll suffer greatly and in many ways that you cannot impact at all. We can learn to rejoice in Christ even in those times, and we must learn how to do so. But sometimes we bring suffering and trials upon ourselves that rob us of the joy of God's presence because we're simply disobedient. Verse 23. What does Jesus say? He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. You say, I don't, I don't feel God's presence. I don't feel the pleasure of his love. I don't, I don't feel in a, in a tangible way. I don't, I'm not experiencing that fellowship. What Jesus says in verse 23 is that the pleasure of God's presence is enjoyed through, not on the basis of, not because of, but through obedience. Sin robs us of the pleasure of his presence. I'm not suggesting that sin is going to cause you to lose your salvation. I am absolutely suggesting to you that sin will poison your life. It will rob you of joy in your heart. That it will take from you the, the sweet awareness of God's presence that is the most precious part of the Christian life. Sometimes it takes pain and a season of spiritual struggle to get our attention off ourselves and back on Jesus. C.S. Lewis described pain as God's megaphone, a way by which he sometimes communicates to us. I'm not saying that if you're suffering right now, it is because you are disobedient. I am saying that if you're suffering and struggling right now, you need to take time to examine your life and to see how God might intend to work for your sanctification so that you can enjoy closer communion with Him. It may be an external trial outside of your control that has brought you to this moment. But, but brother or sister, God is working through that and in that for your good. For your good. That you might know more intimately His presence in your life. And you say, well, what does this obedience look like? This, this obedience that, that is the, a, a vehicle, a channel, as it were, where we experience the nearness of God's presence. Well, it may not be what you're thinking. If you imagine that I'm saying, you may struggle in this life because you neglected your daily Bible reading or didn't attend worship on Sunday night. That's not actually what I'm talking about. I would encourage you to read your Bible, and I would love for all of you to come back on Sunday night. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who is walking in unrepentance. Someone who is indulging the flesh and, and the carnal thoughts and desires of life rather than cultivating spiritual thoughts and attitudes and ideas. And in those situations, the Lord might withdraw a distance in order that you may feel His absence and be removed, or moved rather, to repentance. And our own confession actually talks about this in chapters 17 and 18. I would, I would commend that portion to you for reflection. There are other ways that disobedience may rob us of the joy of God's presence as well, and this is what I'm primarily interested in reflecting upon today. God calls us to rejoice in Christ 
to give thanks in all circumstances and to trust his good purpose and providence in the midst of my suffering. So here is suffering that comes into your life through no fault of your own. You're not responsible for it. There's nothing that you can do about it. You can't impact it in any way. You can't change your circumstances. How do you respond? Jesus says, if any man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father and I will come and live with him. In the house of mourning, in the house of pain, in a house of great grief, in a place of shame, the Father and I will come to him and make our home with him. Am I obeying the Lord in my suffering? Now, someone may say, you know, how can I do that? I, I, I'm in too much pain, but this is the point. It is in that pain that we learn to rely on his strength and not on our own. I cannot rejoice. I cannot give thanks. I cannot trust in God in my own strength and resourcefulness, but it may take pain to convince me of that. See, I may believe otherwise until I'm in so much pain that I realize I can't anymore. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. God answers that prayer. God meets the person in that place. And it may take the Lord hiding his face to show me just how weak I am. In Psalm 30, David speaks of this experience. I would commend the entire psalm to you. I don't have time to read it this morning. But he says in verses 6 and 7 of that psalm, he says, Now in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. David says, everything's good. There, there, there is smooth sailing from here on out. I'm strong. I'm capable. All is well in my world. And the Lord hid his face for a moment so that David might understand that you do not stand in your own strength, that you cannot trust in the circumstances of your own life, I've saved, I've prepared, I've paid off my debts, I've maintained my good health, I'm, I'm involved in my church. What could go wrong? Don't ask that question. The Lord might show you. When I think I am strong, God may withdraw to show me that I am actually weak. He may use the withdrawal of the comfort of His presence to teach me what a true comfort His presence really is. How do I love Christ? By submitting to His will by obeying His commands, even in pain, yes, especially in pain. We obey Him then that we might enjoy His fellowship more fully. Love for Christ is properly demonstrated by obedience to His will. That's the thesis of verse 15. It is the central idea of our sermon today. But I want to be sure that we're thinking of this in the holistic ways in which Scripture speaks of this loving obedience. It's not merely external conformity in lieu of meaningful relationship. No, it's a love that is governed and directed by our duty to Christ, both as Savior and Lord. It's not merely religious ritual and external moral behavior. No, it's a loving devotion encompassing all of life. Love that prompts love for our neighbor, service to our brother, and peace in the midst of life's trials. This obedient love is founded upon the principle and power of God's preceding love for us. It is sustained by His grace and the presence of Christ mediated to us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it is a vehicle through which believers enjoy the personal and experiential joy of communion with the triune God. And so I would leave you with this question, do you love Christ? And I know that you do, or you wouldn't be here, right? Are you demonstrating that love and your willing submission to Him? I believe that you are trying to, that I am trying to, that we certainly desire to. Are we crying out to God for the grace that we need to do so? We will not know the full joy and delight of His love until we receive and respond to it by loving and grateful obedience to Him. Let's bow together in prayer.